behalf of AIOUG. This is Ashwarya and I would like to welcome you to the last day of OG Yatra 2020, an online webinar series. What a ride it has been so far. And fasten your seat belts for this last stretch. OG Yatra is one of the largest user group webinar series, a 14 day long marathon, which has been running from the, la to the, from the 1st to the 16th of July. We have had over 60 plus Oracle Aces, Java champions, groundbreaker ambassadors, and many other technologists from all over the world joining us in this festival of learning. Through the 14 days, we have had eight sessions daily beginning at 10 a.m., which go right up to 10 p.m. What you see now are the speakers for today. Today is, as you know, a database day where we have some really exciting sessions lined up. I hope you've already gone through the agenda and have marked your calendars. I would like to take another minute of your time and introduce you to AIOUG, that is, All India Oracle Users Group. We are one of the largest Oracle Users Group and Sangam is our annual conference that's held either in Hyderabad or Bengaluru. Whereas the Groundbreakers Tour or OG Yatra is a tour where we bring all the speakers to you, to your city. Along with this, we also have regular in-person events across various chapter of course, when it were allowed, and also conduct weekly webinars, which are held every Wednesday. Now, before we move on to the agenda for today, we have one more request. Since we can't be taking selfies like we would be during an in-person event, I request you to kindly take a snapshot of this to not only show support for India's user group community, but more importantly, tag our speakers and thank them for their valuable time and support. We really appreciate them taking out their time and being here. So with that, I would now like to uh, welcome Marcus Mikhailovich, who is here to speak all about standard edition high availability. Marcus has been with Oracle for nearly 20 years and is currently the senior director and manages Oracle database HA, scalability, maximum availability architecture and cloud migration product management team. With that, I would like to well extend a warm welcome to Marcus and request him to take over the screen share. Marcus, uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, good start. Well, thank you so much, Aishwarya. You can call know, me I, Ash. You know. <laughs> that would thank be. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> you did so well on my last time. I was trying to at least try, you know, but. Should have tried before. Thank you so much for this introduction. And yeah, I'm happy to share my screen. Um, it says I can't. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, can yes. you see the screen? Okay, perfect. Yes, okay. With that, then, shall we start? Yes. Yes. Um, hello, and welcome to my evening, morning perhaps afternoon session wherever you are in the world. My name is Markus Michalewicz. Um, I run product management for Oracle Database High Availability, Scalability, and MAA, as previously was said. And I'm speaking to you today out of my San Francisco um, unit, so I'm speaking uh, my bedroom, really. <laughs> and um, that's why the slide says July 15th, but I know for you, mostly it is 10 a.m. in the morning, so good morning. If you have been following Oracle's database high availability, scalability or MA solutions, or either via one of my social media um, systems, Twitter or LinkedIn or SlideShare, you have seen a lot of technology that Oracle offers in this regard. Now, the one that I'm talking about today, standard edition high availability, that one you haven't seen yet because, you know, at least not a presentation because it isn't that old. It has just been released a couple of months ago, a few months ago, meanwhile, uh, earlier this year. So this is the very first presentation that we have on standard edition high availability, the why, the what, and the how. And if you want to hear more about it, just follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn. This slide will be available via SlideShare later on this week. And with that said, let's just look at the agenda for today. But before we do this, uh, uh, I'm part of Oracle development, so I need to show you the safe harbor statement just in case I'm telling you something that I shouldn't be telling you, but I think you're familiar with the content of the slide. So let's see what I want to talk about with you today. 
Generally, I want to talk about standard edition high availability, but I think it seems reasonable to first of all give you a brief introduction how standard edition high availability fits into the greater picture of high availability. So where the name comes from and what it really symbolizes and how it fits in comparison to other high availability solutions that Oracle offers for the Oracle database. And after that introduction, I want to go a little bit more into detail on the what. What actually is standard edition high availability? Why have we released it? And how does it actually work? These will be the three topics and the major part of the presentation, and then I will come to a summary. With that said, I will be leaving you as far as the video is concerned now, because sometimes the video has a bit of a bandwidth in issue, and I wouldn't be able to notice this while I'm presenting. While I'm presenting. So I'll stop the video but you still can hear my voice, I will hope, and I walk you through this presentation. Thank you. As I said before, I want to give you a brief introduction about how standard edition high availability fits into the greater picture of Oracle's high availability database solutions. Now, when we talk about standard edition high availability, obviously, we imply that there are editions of the Oracle database. And some of you may be familiar with this, otherwise I will walk you through it right quick. There are actually two, there are more editions, there's one more, but for the purpose of high availability, there's only two relevant editions to the Oracle database. One is the standard edition. More precisely, they, these days it's called the standard edition two because there was a former version of the standard edition until a few years ago, and that was called the standard edition. So when we changed, the standard edition we call it the new version, and that is now the current version, standard edition two, abbreviated SE2. And then there's an enterprise edition, abbreviated EE. Now, in, 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 for the purpose of full disclosure, as I said, there is a third edition, it's called the XE edition. We'll show it briefly later on. But when you look at high availability, I really would look at either standard edition or enterprise edition. Now, how do these two editions distinguish themselves? Well, if you look at the left side of the picture here, the standard edition is really a sound single instance for SMEs and workgroups. And this description fits very well, even in the context of um, standard edition high availability, because standard edition in its latest version, so with Oracle Database 19C, is really only a single instance database. I will explain this a little bit later on again. And it has a base set of database high, high availability, HA, functionality. So it's good for a work group, it's good for small enterprises, medium enterprises perhaps, that have a certain application that they would like to give to their application, uh, to their customers or to their partners or to their employees in a somewhat highly available fashion. But, you know, a, a downtime due to failover may be acceptable. That's how we would categorize it. Sun Edition doesn't support any options and if you'd like to have a disaster recovery in addition to high availability which is local we will distinguish this later on a little bit more well then disaster recovery is provided by third party solutions or it does not have an integrated dr solution disaster recovery solution for the standard edition if you look at it, then on the right side of the picture the enterprise edition it's really an all inclusive plus option so when i mean when i say all inclusive what i mean is well it has a full set of database high availability functionality. It even has a full set of other functionality, but for the purpose of this presentation, that's what we are focusing on. And it has additional high availability option, options such as active data guard, real application clusters with, with which a lot of you are probably familiar, and then rec one node, which you know colloquially could be described as a little brother of real application clusters, rec one node, and then Oracle sharding. Oracle sharding is one of our newer products in the area of high availability and scalability, but it is available since 12.2. Oracle Enterprise Edition also fully supports Oracle's maximum availability architecture, meaning to say if you'd like to really provide your customers, your employees with a full database that really doesn't have a lot of downtime, probably you can make it so that from the perspective of the application it really doesn't have any downtime. Well, then the Oracle Enterprise Edition will be the right choice for you. Now, which functionality is available in which edition? I cannot go through today. There is, however, our licensing information that describes very well which 
functionality is available in which edition. So if you'd like to follow up on this one, the link is provided below and you will get the slides for download later on. Now, one thing I wanna say is the good thing about Standard Edition and Enterprise Edition is they are not completely different. They are actually based on the same binaries, except for the part that in Standard Edition, some of the functionality has been disabled. You could think about it in this way in a very simple way. And therefore, um, you can always upgrade your standard edition database to an enterprise edition later on if the demand requires it. So if you start with the standard edition and you'd like to use the functionality and the high availability functionality for the standard edition, you can later on easily upgrade, at least technically, to an enterprise edition if the demand justifies such an upgrade or if you just need to do so because the demand has increased significantly. Now, the second part of the name standard edition high availability is obviously high availability or in short HA. And before I combine these two, let me briefly walk you through database high availability solutions in general. And I know for a lot of you, um, this may not be new, but it's very important, especially um, when we talk about database high availability and standard edition high availability, to understand the nuances, because when we release this product, I have received a lot of questions as to how the standard edition high availability thing, uh, in quotes, um, fits into the rest of the picture. And so this is what I'm trying to do here. I'm first mapping general solutions, and then I will map the general solutions to the Oracle solution. So here we have general high availability database solutions, and there are, for example, database inherent, as I call them, high availability features. These are features that come just simply with a single instance database here on the left symbolized by this one pluggable database on one server. Examples for inherent high availability features would be online operations. Very generically speaking, there is a lot of databases that have a certain amount of online operations. Oracle database itself is very good in it. But there are other databases that allow for certain online operations and these are what we would call a database inherent high availability features. One of the major ones that you really want from a database when you look at it, and particularly you get a good solution with the Oracle database is backup and recovery operations. The Oracle database has one of the most sound backup and recovery solutions that I have seen across a lot of databases that I've looked at. And the tool that we will use there is Armin, but the tool is just a tool to manage it. It has a lot to do with it, but in general, the backup and recovery for the Oracle database is pretty sound. Now, however, a backup and recovery has a certain delay, meaning to say if your database fails, you first need to restore and then recover the database. That means it's not really a very highly available database if you think about it. And if you want to do any better, you're quickly looking into cluster-based failover solutions. That's typically how we would categorize them. So any solution that fails over your single instance database as is symbolized by this failing over database. Um, this is what we call a cluster-based failover. And cluster-based failover solutions are local HA solutions. So in other words, normally your cluster is in close proximity. So if the, if the, if the building fails or the room fails, meaning to say by a fire, for example, well, they don't necessarily protect your whole lot. What they do do is a database failover from one server to another in case of a server failure or instance failure. Right? If your instance fails, it fails it over to the other node. If the server fails, it does so the same. And there's smaller components that could fail that would trigger the same, but we come to the details later on. Now, in addition to cluster-based failover and local HA solutions, we have the so-called disaster recovery solutions or the R solutions, which are often referred to also as remote HA solutions. The difference here is that these solutions protect your database even if your whole building, your whole area collapses. A typical example would also be if your data center is subject to a power outage, as we had a power outage here in San Francisco not too long ago. Well, then these disaster recovery solutions can be used to fail over your whole database to another typically more remote uh, failover system. And therefore, you can resume operations uh, in the other data center site. Now, the last solution that I want to talk about, even though it's, you know, could be a local solution again, but it also could be a remote HA solution, is an active-active high availability solution or active-active HA. 
When I say it could be local or remote, it depends really what solution you're using. I will be walking you through the Oracle solutions in a minute and we'll see what I'm saying. But basically, um, what an active, active high, uh, high availability solution different, differentiates from the other solutions is that you can access the database or the data set from multiple servers concurrently. So you have a really active, active operation ongoing here. And in case of a failure, normally what happens is the database doesn't have to restart the database instance, but another database instance that is already running in whatever capacity takes over the work that has just failed. This is the huge difference and thereby HA, um, pardon me, active active HA solutions are the ones that are providing most of the protection um, because they can also be local and remote. Now with that said, let me give you a mapping of these general solutions to the Oracle equivalent. And then you perhaps will see what I mean, especially for the last area. So I start again on the top left of the picture where I say database inherent high availability features. And if you look at the Oracle database, um, there are database inherent data high availability features for the standard edition and the enterprise edition. I spoke about this in, a, in the first slide where I said, okay, there's certain features in the standard edition and some in the enterprise edition. They are different, but they are available. What is also available to you as part of the database inherent feature catalog, so to speak, is Oracle Restart. Oracle Restart is a single node, single node using grid infrastructure for standalone server because you have only one node. That's what's symbolized on the left side. And this Oracle Restart will be used to bring up the stack to start the stack, especially the order of ASM and then the database. And if either an ASM instance or a database instance fails, it will automatically restart those. This is what is Oracle Restart. And I'm emphasizing this one because it is not standard edition high availability. We'll come back to this later, but just so you see the difference. Because as you move over to the right side in the top row of the picture, you will see that standard edition high availability is clearly a cluster-based failover solution, therefore a local HA solution. And it's also not REC1 node because REC1 node is listed separately. REC1 node is very well a failover solution. It's also cluster-based, but it's not the same thing as standard edition high availability. And I will show later why that is. Walking through the lower part of the picture, disaster recovery is again a remote HA solution. And in Oracle terms, that would be data guard or active data guard. Right, um, Active Data Guard has a little bit more functionality, however, requires the Active Data Guard option, where, whereas Data Guard is part of the Enterprise Edition functionality, but you need to license two Enterprise Editions, what we would call the primary and the standby. Now, when you walk then to the right side, Active Active High Availability, again, this could be local HA or it could be remote HA. Um, I should probably correct this in the slide here, but from a local HA solution, you have Oracle REC, which is what is pictured here. This is the symbolized Oracle Real Application Cluster. But you could also have Oracle Sharding, and you could also have Oracle Golden Gate. And here you see uh, where the Active Active comes in. Oracle Golden Gate is an Active Active solution. It's a replication-based solution. And, but it does allow you to operate independently on the replicated databases. So therefore, it's technically an active, active solution. Now, coming back right quickly to Active Data Guard. Active Data Guard, for the longest time, didn't really fall into the active, active HA categorization. But with 19C, where we have DML redirect or the possibility to make upgrades on the standby, it could move into the active, active area for the purpose of distinguishing. Um, I have not done this here, but just so you would know. Now, if I look at these solutions a little bit from a different angle and try to rank them by approximate, protect, uh, approximate protection level, especially on premises, it would look something like this picture. So from the bottom left to the right top, what I've listed here are exactly the symbols um, that we used on the other two slides, but I have kind of arranged them how much protection they provide. And I have also provided some combinations. Let me quickly walk you through the slides so you would see what I mean. <clears throat> Obviously, again, we start with a single instance database on the bottom left here, right? Um, 
below, uh, right on top of the upgrade path, which is set over there. And then we have the cluster failover solution. Needless to say that obviously when you have a cluster, you have a better high availability. Next in line is the real application cluster. Again, it re represents real application cluster sharding if you so want uh, as well. The next two is a combination. And you know, you could argue whether you know, a failover cluster plus disaster recovery, which is what this uh, combination symbolizes here, and rec plus disaster recovery is rightly ranked here. One could say, well, if I add disaster recovery to my failover database, I may already be better or not as good as rec. It depends a little bit on your personal point of view here, but in general, I have said, okay, it is rec, then a failover solution plus the, plus the R, or rec plus the R, which is what these two symbols symbolize here. And last but not least, we would have the same combination, rec plus the R, uh, uh, but the rec part is here being replaced by an exadata database machine, which is inherently a rec database, and then you can combine this with the R. Now, coming back to the combination of failover and rec plus the R, um, this is where MAA, and if you're familiar with the maximum availability architecture, this is where our gold level basically is based on. So gold MAA, and we have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum currently, especially on premises. The MAA maximum availability gold level or gold architecture for mission critical databases foresees that you have a failover solution at least, which means rack one node, or ideally you have rack and physical replication in addition to an already established backup and recovery system, which you had presumably already with your single instance database. That's why I have combined the two DR solutions right there because most of our MAA customers that have a mission critical database actually are in this gold level. One last comment here so that you would fully understand the picture. Um, as I moved from single instance and failover over to rack, I also implied as far as Oracle is concerned that I moved from standard edition to enterprise edition because, and that is part of what we will be talking in a few minutes, we will be talking about in a few minutes, because with Oracle Database 19C, we have stock supporting Rack in standard edition, for which reason the only alternative you have is a failover cluster solution, standard edition high availability. And if you really like to have Rack and you want to move up into the gold and other levels of MAA, well, then you have to upgrade at least on premises from SE, standard edition that is, to enterprise edition. I hope. That explains the picture. And now that you understand the picture and how these you know, different solutions reflect a different protection level, you can make these comparisons with all sorts of other high availability solutions. For example, when I spoke first about Oracle Restart or later on I spoke about standard edition high availability internally, people started comparing it with virtualization-based high availability solutions. What are those? Well, if you use Oracle VM, if you use VM there, if you use Kubernetes or Docker, all of these solutions have some sort of a high availability solution. Staying with a uh, virtual machine, if you have a virtual machine such as Oracle VM or Oracle VM, uh, or VMware, not Oracle VMware, pardon me there, um, these solutions give you high availability. So what they do is they detect the failure of the VM and would restart it either on the same or another server, which is symbolized here for single instance with a black box and the failover cluster likely as well. And also for DR, some of these solutions do have a DR solution based on storage replication most of the time, by which you can replicate your VM uh, to another server, at least the data of a VM, and then start it up should the first system fail. These are, these are all possible, but bear in mind, please, that from, a, from the perspective of the VM solution, they are operating on the VM itself, on the virtual machine, machine itself. I call this a black box failover. They are very similar to the other solutions, except you have not the same inside into the VM. So if, for example, your database is running in a VM, you can still fail over the whole VM on a failure of the VM itself, or even if the database itself is stalling, they typically can detect this. Where these solutions lack a little bit of an insight is typically 
to protect you from minor component failures that are, that are very important. Typical example would be um, you have a listener. You know, if your listener fails, your database is still operational, except it cannot be connected to anymore because without a listener, there is no connection to a database. So the listener becomes a really important component of your database stack for it to be fully operational. And a lot of the HA solutions either do not have this protection level so that they can restart the VM on the listener level or based on a listener failure, or the pinging of the listener, which is typically what they would do then, you know, it's rather granular. So it's not exactly the same level, which is why they are a little bit um, lower in my ranking here. Now, as you can move to the VM solution side, you could also move to the cloud. And Oracle, specifically the Oracle cloud, provides all of the database high availability solutions that I have talked about so far and that I will be talking about for the rest of the time in the Oracle Cloud. And you, know, you can start your single instance in even our infrastructure cloud, but as soon as you wanna have REC, and that's symbolized here, you wanna to move to a database cloud service. If you wanna have DR, you basically get DR in the Oracle Cloud or any cloud for this matter by replicating the service. So if you'd like to have um, REC or and DR for REC, then you would basically have two database cloud services mm, together and again synchronized via data guard as if you would do it on premises. The same then goes for Exadata, uh, Exadata, cloud, Exadata cloud service and even for the Oracle Autonomous Database. Now the Oracle Autonomous Database becomes a very special position on my ranking here because Unlike for all the other solutions where you still have to perform a certain amount of manual operation, the autonomous database is fully automated, hence the name autonomous. And therefore, in terms of high availability, you avoid the potential from human errors or machine errors if you so want. And therefore, um, the Oracle database, the Oracle autonomous database is the highest level of protection in my ranking here because it eliminates an, a complete error or failure group. However, moving to the cloud in general is beneficial because the cloud has the combination of the software, especially the Oracle Cloud, uh, the, the combination of the software, the hardware, and the operating system owned by Oracle, which makes the whole cloud setup more stable, which is why overall all these solutions rank a little bit higher than was originally case, the case for the other fa failover solutions on premises. I hope that makes sense. Now, with that, being clarified, I'd like to go a little bit more into the what actually is standard edition high availability. And what we have done is when we introduced standard edition high availability, we have made sure that the documentation is very detailed. It was a completely new product, so we wanted to make sure that all the important aspects of standard edition high availability are very well documented, and we worked a lot in the development team on this, and therefore, when I talk about the what, the why, and the how, you will find some links to the documentation as you will find it here in the subtitle. Because the link here in the subtitle would refer you to the definition of standard, uh, high, standard edition high availability, which provides fully integrated cluster-based failover for single instance standard edition Oracle databases using Oracle Clusterware. That is the epitome of the definition. That is what we do here. We use Oracle Clusterware as part of Oracle Grid Infrastructure. We use a single instance standard edition database and fail it over. That is what it says. The important part that I also put here in italic is fully integrated. You could have done what we have done with standard edition high availability manually many years ago. As a matter of fact, in 11G release one and two timeframes, we had scripts floating where you could have used the scripts to fail over a single instance database. We have now professionalized this, we have now productized this, we have fully integrated the solution. So it's really not comparable to what we had some age nine years ago. However, standard edition high availability still benefits uh, from Oracle Clusterware, Oracle Automatic Storage Management, and indirectly the ASM cluster file system, which you can use as part of grid infrastructure as well. Consequently, we expect that the failover times for sun high availability are very good, particularly in comparison to other clustering solutions where you need to remount volumes of file systems. And just to be very clear, the standard edition high availability is supported on Linux. So 
64-bit, of course, Oracle Solaris, and Microsoft Windows. So on all of the you know, very common operating systems already supported, and then we will provide support for the others, such as HP UX and AIX. That support is planned perhaps for later this year. Um, so if you're looking in this, you may get it, but it gets a little bit more tricky given the licensing restrictions, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Generally, if you want to look into what operating systems um, standard edition high availability is supported on, it's following Oracle Cluster Web certification. So overall, we will map this one to one, unless it's otherwise stated in the documentation again. Now, now that I've explained to you what it is, let me briefly walk you through the slide that I've shown you before and define what is what it is not. So standard edition high availability is clearly a local high availability solution and it uses cluster-based failover. It isn't Oracle Restart. It is not a REC database. This is very important to understand. It has no REC code in it and therefore you don't get active a active high availability and also i think this was clear by now you can't really have disaster recovery either and again if you'd like to see how standard edition high availability compares to all these other solutions there is actually a documentation that talks about how standard edition compares to all the others which is linked over here now with that said I did get a lot of questions when some additional high availability came out. The most commonly asked ones or the most frequently asked ones I've listed here is CIHA, some additional high availability, the same as REC1 node. And I think by now you should have seen that no, it is not. It is really um, not a REC enabled database. REC1 node is also an option to the Oracle Enterprise Edition. CIHA is not, CIHA is part of standard edition. REC1 node uses the same infrastructure. However, it provides more functionality than um, standard edition high availability. One would, for example, be the online database relocation, which I will refer to later again. And then CIHA has no REC code enabled. Therefore, it cannot be the same as REC1 node. Does CIHA follow Oracle standard edition to licensing? Yes, it does. Now there's two things to note here. The standard edition Standard Edition 2 in particular license has a socket restriction of two sockets. And then a socket can have multiple CPUs, but two sockets per server. If you are familiar with Standard Edition Rack, the restriction was a little bit more defined. We now follow Standard Edition 2 licensing, which is to say that CR is restricted to servers with two socket maximums. However, in the cluster that you use to run your CHAR databases or your CHAR database if you have only one, you can have multiple, up to 100, multiple of these two socket servers. That is perfectly fine. And it is, there is no such restriction as you may have heard about for some additional racks. So you know, two sockets per server, multiple of these servers in the cluster are fully allowed for CHAR. Now, the other thing that is important to understand when it comes to standard edition, standard edition itself is also limited by the number of CPU or CPU threads, to be precise, that you can use. So how many CPUs does CIHA use per server? Because remember, you have two sockets maximum per server. In each socket, you can have um, one CPU with, with multiple cores, and then each core can also have a hyper thread enabled or Multiple threads enabled depends on what architecture you're using. So all this doesn't matter to standard edition high availability databases. What matters is how many CPUs are reported on operating system. These could either be cores or threads. And how many of those do we actually use for standard edition high availability more precisely for the foreground processes? And the number to which, uh, to this answer, or the, the, the number to answer this question is 16 CPU threads. So if your operating system reports 16 CPUs, we will use those 16 CPUs. If your operating system reports 32 CPUs, we will use 16, the equivalent, not exactly, it's not pinned, the equivalent of 16 of these CPUs, maximum four foreground processes. The other ones we will basically leave alone. And again, it doesn't matter at this moment because we wouldn't know in doubt um, whether those are threats or calls. 
can CIHA be licensed using the 10-day failover rule? The 10-day failover rule describes that you have to only license one server in a cluster of two, as long as the second server, which you will have to name, can, is not used for more than 10 days a year. That's roughly the definition. The exact definition you can read up in this document that I've linked there. But in general, yes, CIHA can be licensed using the 10, 10 they fail overall as any other cluster solution would be eligible for the same. I hope that explains the most frequently asked questions because I need to move on to the why we actually invented standard edition high availability, particularly now that I already revealed that standard edition REC is de-supported effective with 19C. So if you upgrade to an Oracle database 19C, you can't use standard edition REC anymore. So why did we do this? Well, it has a lot to do with the latter thing that I described with the fact that standard edition 2 doesn't support more than two sockets, for example, per server. Um, because in standard edition REC, we had a more restrictive licensing by which you could have only had two sockets in the cluster. So that would mean you would have to find two one socket servers for standard edition REC. While you can do this, the standard is more and more that our customers have bought two socket servers, and therefore we wanted to bump up the number of sockets per server that you can use, still maintaining the high availability that our customers have used standard edition rack for. So the idea was born to say, okay, you know, standard edition high availability seems to serve the high availability requirements that we have seen across our standard edition or former standard edition rack customer but yet allows you to use more of the standardized two socket servers. So if I was to combine this, standard edition two Oracle Rack has seen diminishing demand with two socket servers becoming a standard and increased high availability requirements. So there were two factors which led to Rack in standard edition seemed not to be opportune anymore. And so we said, okay, you know, standard edition high availability provides the required high availability and enables multiple upgrade passes. What does that mean? Well, as I said before, sometimes you start small and you have to grow out. That applies to scalability solutions as much as it applies to high availability solutions. So standard edition high availability allows you by upgrading to the enterprise edition to increase your high availability and or your scalability, and it has a clear upgrade path. I do understand that this is a, an upgrade path that comes with some monetary investments, so with some costs, but we also have a very good alternative for you. And I encourage everyone to look at this because a migration to in particular the autonomous database in the Oracle Cloud is a very attractive upgrade path for customers that have standard edition rack or even have standard edition high availability and later on need to improve or increase the scalability of their solution, then the upgrade to either the database cloud service or in particular, the Oracle Autonomous Database is a very good upgrade path. Why is that? It's because A, we have a very interesting financial mapping for the socket licensing of the standard edition to the autonomous database. And two, the functionality that you have in the standard edition by it being a limited high availability solution as introduced before, you are very likely to be able to move your application to Oracle Autonomous Database without um, being affected by any functional uh, impairment, meaning to say it will just continue to operate on the Autonomous Database. If you need more information about this, I gave once a presentation on um, this topic, meaning to say, I talked about database availability and scalability across versions and editions. You may want to follow this link down here. Now, with that said, we are following in this thought here the flow of any good idea or startup for that matter. So, if you look at a simplified industry growth or startup life cycle, you start very small. I wouldn't recommend you start with the Express edition, which is the third edition that I promised I wouldn't talk too much about. But if you have an idea, you start with standard edition. As you grow your idea, you can stay on standard edition. And eventually, you may want to look into the enterprise edition once your solution has been expanded or matured. And you can, you know, put it simple, afford to use the full fledged solution, particularly even MAA. 
Now, how does this all work? I mean, so far I have telling, I've been telling you why we did it, a little bit what we did, but how does it actually work is what I will be talking about for the next 15 minutes, and then we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Now, the easiest way to set up your Oracle Standard Edition High Availability Database or CH database is to follow the documentation. As I said before, we put a lot of effort in providing a very complete set of documentation. For example, we have a chapter on requirements. Now, I have extracted the most important requirements for you here on the right side. The CHA minimum requirements are at least two nodes of a standalone Oracle Grid infrastructure 197 or later cluster. Very short sentence, but very important. There's a few things I wanna highlight. If you would like to use Oracle Standard Edition High Availability, you've got to install Grid Infrastructure 197, not 193, four or five, 197, because that is the first version with which we have supported some additional high availability. The same, by the way, then goes for the database. We would like you to keep this um, um, the same. So at least for the first version, later on, we follow the common practice for the database, but also to have a full standard edition Oracle database support, we would recommend you use a standard edition Oracle database home of version 19.7 or later. Now, as I mentioned before, your cluster can be as big as it wants up to the supported number of 100 nodes. But within that cluster, you need to have at least two nodes on which you want to configure standard edition high availability. You can do this using local. So this is for infrastructure. And you can do this using local or shared ACFS homes. So if you install your database later following the documentation, you can choose whether your database home should be on each node in the cluster, on each node that you want to run the standard edition high availability on, database on. Or you can say, okay, I use ACFS, which is part of grid infrastructure, can be used free of charge. And I put a centralized home on my shared storage and I run my databases out of the same home. Both are supported. There are pros and cons to doing either, which are not discussed today, but we would support that. However, as we do fail over your standard edition high availability database, we really need you to put the SP file and the password file on a shared location so it is available from each node. We debated whether this could be done locally and perhaps you could walk around it, but as you would want to put the database into shared storage, either based on ASM or ACFS anyway, please do put the SP file and the password file for the database into ASM or ACFS. Last but not least, we have chosen to let your standard edition high availability register with the scan listeners um, as part of the remote listener registration. And secondary, we would register them with the local listeners. This is particularly good for those who had used um, standard edition rack before because this infrastructure is exactly the same and we can continue to connect the same way as we did before. So this was actually the idea behind it. If you had a standard edition rack database and you now want to convert to standard edition high availability, you can still use the same service name, the, scan, the same scan name, the, scan, the same scan setup. You just have to register your standard edition high availability accordingly. So there's a good transition for you. And for those who are coming new to standard edition high availability, this is just the requirement that we have here. Now, secondly, what I want to point out is there is no direct upgrade path to configure standard edition high availability databases. So whether you had a uh, 18C, 12C database before, even if you had a 19C database before, you would still have to operate on, a, on the database to register your database as a standard edition high availability database. For those of you who had standard edition rack before, what you would want to uh, do is you want to do nothing to your infrastructure because the same infrastructure that was used for standard edition rack is now being used for standard edition high availability. But you do want to upgrade your Oracle Grid infrastructure to 19.7 as formerly discussed. And then you want to follow my Oracle support note 25.04078.1 because this note will describe how you down convert your former or your standard edition rack database to a standard edition database so that you then can register this database 
with Oracle Cluster as a standard edition high availability database. Basically, you follow the same documentation as all the others who would be new to Oracle Database 19C. So if you have a new Oracle 19C deployment, just follow the instructions provided in the CR documentation link up here, and then you will get your standard edition database uh, configured. Now, the documentation is very useful. I walk you through the simple steps, at least the simplest of which, meaning to say a basic configuration. And the basic configuration assumes registering a single instance database with Oracle Clusterware on two or more nodes of the cluster. As I said before, the commands to use are either server control at database or server control modify database. The difference is really as to whether you have an existing database, which you first had as a single instance registered with Oracle Clusterware, and then now you want to transform it into a um, standard edition high availability, or you want to, you know, you have the database running on your system, it's just not registered in Oracle Clusterware at all. For this case, you use server control at database. And then you add the database with the database name DB, and then you give it a database name. You define the Oracle home from which it is running. And here you can see what is very important. You define this database to be a single instance database. There is no DB type like CHA. It's a single instance database. And your single instance database is registered with Oracle Clusterware and registered as a standard edition high availability database simply by adding two nodes for the node parameter, as I have done here, node one and node two. I hope that makes sense. And it is very important to see this because this distinguishes the configuration from others. It's not a single instance database. It's a single instance database for which there's two or more nodes. You could have more nodes in the node list configured. And that makes it a standard edition high availability. And that triggers the failover and all the other things that I'm going to talk about. In a few slides. It's also important to notice that we do check whether you register a standard edition, so you cannot apply the same solution to an enterprise edition. Just saying. One last comment here. The note list that I have now talked about for a minute or two is ordered. So in other words, if you put node one and node two, what you indirectly are saying is when the database starts up, we try to start it on node one. Only if node one is not available, we will be going to node two. Similarly, if a database is running on either of the two nodes and now subject to a failure, the node list will be taken and we looked at and it says, okay, which is the node that it is the first in the list? And that one is the one that we will fail over to, unless of course we are already running on it, then it's the next in the, in the line. And also bear in mind, please, that the node list is ordered as long as we can honor it. Meaning to say, let's assume you have a note list containing your five nodes. And even though the order in the note list would now say that your database should all fail over to node number three, there could be other circumstances in the cluster that would prevent you from that happening. Perhaps node three is not operational or is in an unstable state. So the cluster could decide to deviate from the order in the notes list provided because of other circumstances, you kind of forcing him to do so just so this would be clear. In either case, once you have then started up your listener, uh, sorry, once you have started up your database, you need to make sure for it to be reached and therefore you need to make sure that the, in, in, the in, in, in initialization parameter local listener is not set. You don't wanna set this listener. If it's set, please do reset it. If you use the data, if your data files are stored on Oracle, ASM cluster file system. It would also be good to register the ASM cluster file system with the database resource. There is a um, step in the documentation that will explain the details so that you don't lose the connection between the file system availability and the database. The real tip that I wanted to come to on this slide here is, as I mentioned before, a CR database will always use the full 16 CPU threads that is allowed for a standard edition database. So if your CH database runs on my node one as shown here, it will use 16 CPU threads. And if it goes down, it will use the same 16 CPU threads on the other node. For standard edition REC customers who are familiar with the setup, that wasn't the case. The REC database instance would have had half of the CPU threads per node. 
because you could have only 16 total in standard edition high availability in standard edition. Standard edition high availability has only one instance running, therefore it always gets the full 16 threads. However, remember a node must have more than must not have more than two sockets. You cannot have more than two sockets on any of the nodes on which you want to operate a standard edition. Now, once you have configured your database in the outlined way and you confirm whether the database is configured correctly with SRVCTL config database, database then database name, what you get is a CHA environment, which means that up on the first two failures, first two failures, the CHA instance will be restarted on the same node and up on the third failure, the CI instance will be restarted on the other next available node configured in the node list. So how this looks is as follows. You get a failure on the running CR database instances on node one. Up on this failure, we will restart locally is what we call it. And hopefully nothing will happen. But if a second failure happens, we will do this yet one more time. However, there is an enhancement request file to will which will reduce this number to one. So we will not restart twice. We will only restart once on the node and then do what currently happens on the third failure, which is failing over the standard addition to another node. So this is the difference here. So right now, two failures on the third one, we, fail, we, we will fail over standard addition high availability databases to another node. In future, it will be on the first, after the first failure. So meaning with the second failure, we will fail over. Now, not everything is a failure in life, luckily, shall I say. You know, there are certain circumstances in, under which you may want to relocate a database. One would be because you used your cluster for consolidation. So in my case here, I have two nodes and I've consolidated many, many databases, standard edition databases on these two nodes. Now three ended up on the left side or node one and one ended up on the right side, node two. In interest of balancing my servers and maybe optimizing performance across the two servers, I could decide to relocate my database. And therefore we have the relocate database command. The command that you would like to issue is SRVCTL relocate database. Again, you specify the database name via DB. And then you say, which node should your database go to? So in other words, you would want to issue this command against a certain database. It doesn't matter whether it's on the first or the second node where you issue the command, but you issue it against the database. And wherever this database is running now, it will be relocated to node number two as given your instructions. Of course, if it's already running there, you will get an, a prospective message. But you only have to define the destination node. And then what we will do is we will relocate the database, which is an implicit stop and a subsequent start of the database instance. So just to be clear, because there is a huge difference between the SRVCTL relocate database and what Oracle Rec1 node does with online database relocation. SRVCTL relocate database um, issued against the CR database will stop the instance and relocate it by starting it on another node. With Rec, we will temporarily, Rec1 node in particular, we will temporarily start two instances simultaneously. That can only be done with Rec1 node. It isn't even a Rec feature. That is specific to Rec1 node, which is also why CI and Rec1 node are not the same. If you do use a service on the standard edition high availability database, which we do recommend, please be aware that the relocate command can currently be delayed due to bug 3.11.28.434, which is listed in the release notes. It has to do with the file, um, with the, the service keeping a file lock open. We are working on to optimizing this. So there may be a subtle delay, but there's already a patch out there. So a patch on top of 19.7. Uh, if you apply this patch, you recreate the service, you should see no more of such delay or a very short one at least because this is what the bug um, aims to optimize. Now, if this bug disturbs you much and you haven't got the patch yet, or in general, if you don't want to relocate, obviously you can start and stop the database or shall I say, stop and start the database manually. And therefore we have two commands, SRVCTL start database, and you can define the node on which it should start. Um, or you do stop database, and then it does what you think it would do. It stops the database. If you do SRVCTL start database and you provide a node 
that means the node um, will overwrite perhaps the node order in the node list. So you will explicitly start the database on a particular node. Now I've talked about failure and relocation. What are the expected failure and relocation times that you could expect if you do either a failure test or perhaps a relocation test? And in our test, you know, and the results may you know, vary greatly depending on workload and your actual system. So if your system is small, but the workload is high, especially the failover take, may take longer. But in general, what we have seen for a reasonably sized system with a reasonably sized workload, that a failover after a node panic, for example, takes roughly two minutes, whereas the DB relocation, because it is planned, so you shouldn't be doing it while you are running under full load, takes approximately one minute, and it's a little bit more uh, smoother. Therefore. And these are not numbers that I have um, made up. These are actually numbers that a colleague of mine in development has tested for me. And he has also provided me with this demo, which describes exactly what I have shown you here. So this is a swing bench uh, operating against the CR 197 database. We have roughly 700 transactions being run against this database with approximately 200 users, as you can see here. And now what we do here is we issue or we simulate, should I say, a node panic. So the node on which the database instance was running had a node panic and you see immediately the transactions go down to zero. But after a very short period of time, the database instance is restarted on the other node. Or, pardon me, it's restarted and therefore um, restarted or failed over to the other node. It depends on what number of failure this was. And therefore we resume operation very swiftly. Now, if you would do the same thing and this time relocate the database, you would see the same thing again. We relocate the database means we explicitly stop it. And therefore the transactions go down to zero for a short period of time. But as you can see, it is much shorter this time. So it does confirm that a node panic took in this particular test approximately two minutes, a little less than that, and the relocation approximately one minute. So this is what we have tested. And so far, this has been confirmed across various tests, but again, workload and or system may lead to different values in your case. With that said, I'm nearly in the end of my presentation. We might even have a few minutes for questions and answers because this is a summary. Standard edition high availability is a fully integrated and documented solution. I really would like to emphasize this because we are not planning to provide white papers or anything beyond this uh, presentation perhaps because everything that I've talked about today is actually already documented. Technically, it's a fully integrated cluster-based failover solution for single instance standard edition Oracle databases. It uses Oracle Clusterware, Oracle Automatic Storage Management, and ACFS, depends a bit on the configuration, because this is all part of the infrastructure. And it provides the required availability for most applications using a standard edition Oracle database. And if you would like to see how to work with it, how to create it, to start it, anything that I've shown you, except for the three entries, adding a node, removing a configured node and deactivating standard edition because none of which, at least not deactivating is what I would like you to do because I would like you to create a standard edition database after this presentation. Therefore, I have walked you through this. These other three steps are still documented very well. So if you want to test it, create it, follow my slide deck and then deactivate it using the documentation is basically what I'm saying. With that said, thank you so very much for staying with me that early morning or that light, late night but um, I would be available with, uh, for, for some questions. Hopefully I have some answers. In either case, thank you already for staying with me. Back to you, um, uh, Oracle India, Oji Yatra. Hi, Marcus. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to take the questions right now? I see a few in the Q&A panel. Let me, let me open up the Q&A panel here. Is Oracle Direct, I can, certainly take a few, I think. Um, tell me when we are running out of time, please. Absolutely. Is Oracle Direct NFS supported as a shared file system? Thank you for asking. Um, no, currently it is not. If this is a huge requirement, Mr. McDonald, um, we could probably look into it, but right now it's a not supported configuration. 
Second question by uh, Yitendra Singh. When moving from enterprise edition rack to CIHA, will customers say something as monetary? This is a very good question. I would like not to discuss licensing questions in greater detail. What you're basically saying is, can we return an Oracle rack, full enterprise edition rack license to obtain a CIHA um, database license to go forward? I would recommend you discuss this with your local um, account team um, or you shoot me an email later and I can see how I can help you out here. In which business scenario one should choose REC over CIHA? Excellent question. This is exactly the other route. When do you want to upgrade to REC? Perhaps given that you have CIHA or if you have a certain business scenario, which one do you choose? Well, I think a lot of this depends on what your expectations are in terms of how much capacity does your database need to serve the application and the, uh, get the expected response time. So it's really a sizing question in the first place because, um, because remember standard edition high availability uses maximum 16 CPU slots. If you believe that your database can perform well enough for your application and your business scenario, you may consider standard edition high availability for that area. Secondly, you would want to look into what are your high availability requirements. Remember, it's a cluster-based failover solution. So if your expectation is that your application can really not see any downtime when there's a failure or not even when you relocate, standard edition high availability is not your best choice. You would probably want to look into um, higher rack or rack. And then again, if you foresee that you need to protect your standard, uh, pardon, your database with more than just cluster based or local high availability by disaster recovery, again, the enterprise edition would be your better choice. I hope that sufficiently answers your question. Uh, your question. Otherwise, please do reach out to me after this presentation. Ah, this is an interesting question, even though I cannot answer it. When to use which option fan, fast connection failover, tough, any reference and docs, please. I can personally not talk about this today clearly anymore, um, nor had I planned to do so. But if you look back across the various um, presentations been done in course of OG Yatra, um, I think Ludovico, for example, has talked about, uh, about FAN and uh, FCF and all these components to ensure availability uh, in greater length than I can do this possibly here. And he has a great presentation earlier on, uh, two weeks ago. So that would be a recommendation to look at this uh, presentation to un uh, answer your question. I will have to skip the e Oracle Unified Directory. That seems a little bit outside of the topic here, but if I misunderstand again, feel free to reach out. How, can, how we can ensure that the service will be relocated from preferred node to available in case of a failure? We have a REC two node app service is running from prefer. Okay, this seems to be more like a REC question. I would love to take it. Um, uh, last uh, Friday, we had the fireside chat. It would have been a great question for there. Now it is probably a question that you will want to send me via email. I'm happy to answer it. Okay, Marcus, I think I with think that we are done with the questions. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And I would like to request, I have a request for all our participants, uh, head over to Twitter, take a selfie or take a snapshot of this and thank Marcus for his time and such a brilliant presentation. That is something you would really appreciate. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. And with that, before we close, I do have a few announcements. The first one of which is, uh, this is the session that we were supposed to have last earlier this week. And we are having it next week. That would be the 22nd of July, 6 p.m. IST. The registrations for this are now open. So head over to our portal and you can register for this now. The Oracle Rack Performance Optimizations on Exadata by Anil Lair. Again, uh, a few things around Learn and Win. This is the program. You're probably already aware about the program. The announcement for this is that could you send your send your emails with the required snapshots to uh, ogyatra at aiouj.org and we will add the bonus points. 
and before we close another request head over to our portal and you'll find a bunch of interviews that jim bob and javed have been conducting with almost all of our speakers so head over there they are very short uh, interviews 20 minutes interview or 10 to 20 minutes somewhere in that range and sometimes they get really funny and you'll find some really interesting things about a speaker what prompted them what more to pick the topic they spoke about uh, or some really fun facts about them so it's an enjoyable experience last thing we would request you is a feedback for our speaker and you can also use this form to post in any further questions you have so you can scan this qr code and put in your feedback or you would be routed to the survey link as soon as you close the uh, meeting session with that i would like to extend a big thank you to marcus again from behalf of everybody here and we have our next session coming up shortly See you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.